Howdy, howdy. Why you change everything? That's the title of the day. Why you change everything? And last week, I was uh, talking about God and, 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 and how I think God likes uh, renovating and, and renewing things and restoring things. God's in the restoration business. And today, the scripture reading that we read from Matthew chapter 5, in verse 17, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And there are several verses in the Bible that talks about God and how he changes not. And I don't think, I, I, don't, like, I don't like a lot of change. I'm not big on changes. And I remember my mom she used to like to change the furniture around. Every so often, she'd like to move the furniture around. And my dad would throw a fit. He would come to sit in his favorite spot, and it was moved, or it was a different chair. And I remember the lectures that he would give us. You know, why do you change everything? Why do you change the house around? Why do you change? And she was paying up different curtains. And he said, why do you change the curtains for he said, some houses have the same curtains hanging up for 50 years. They're beautiful. They're hanging up there forever, the same curtains. Why do you change them for? Why do you got to change things? And uh, I think it's more of a men thing. You know, we like sort of stuff to say that if there's nothing wrong with it and it works, leave it alone. And I think God's a little like that. He don't like a lot of change. And a lot of times I think we... Try to change things, and God is perfect, and there's no reason for it. Why do you change everything? And I want to take you this morning to the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1. And uh, it says there in Genesis chapter 1, this is a story of how God created the world. Now, how many of you believe that God created the world? One or two hands. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, that's a lot. That's the skies, the ozone layer, the atmosphere, the, the earth, all this stuff. And it says that in verse 5, that God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the first day. Now, that's a little strange, isn't it? Because we don't count days that way. We count them from midnight to midnight now. Right? And so, in, in most of us, we think of the, the, the day starting in the morning when you get up. But here he says the evening and the morning were the first day. So when the sun set, the day began. And when the sun set the next day, the day began. The evening and the morning were the first day. But we don't count them that way. You know why? Because we've changed it. We count it a different way. We count the days different. We change things. Now, he says here... And verse 8, he says, And God called a firmament heaven that he had made, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So he made the, the atmosphere, the sky. And then in verse 13, it says the evening and the morning were the third day. And prior to that, it talks about how he made the seas and, and, and vegetation and, and the bushes and the trees and things such as that. And then in verse 19 there, in Genesis chapter 1, it says that the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And during that day, it says that he made the sun and the moon and the stars. And sometimes people argue over the stars. They say, you know, it would take 20 million years. For the, at the speed of light, it would take 20 million years or whatever amount of time for the light of that star to make it to earth. Therefore, the earth must be millions and billions and trillions and zillions of years old. But you know God can do anything. He could have put the light there. He could have made the stars while he was making the earth. He could have made the stars by the earth and drug it out, right? Drug it, drug it out. I mean, a lot going on there. 
And then we look at verse 23. And the Bible tells us there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 23. Well, it says, The evening and the morning were the fifth day. And the verses before that talk about how he made the birds and, and the fish and things such as that. And then in verse 31, it says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And on that day, God made Adam and Eve. And so in six days, he made all his... Now, you guys told me that you believe that God made the world. That's what you told me. I didn't squeeze that out of you. Some of you raised your hand. Some of you didn't just raise your hand. Some of you raised your hand like that, right? And you know what that means. That means I'm really all about it, right there. That's, that's those dedicated ones that do, the, that do the handshake. And that's what you told me. Now, I want to ask you something. Do you believe that God put the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky? Do you believe they made them? Do you believe that? That's what you're telling me now. All right, so he made them, and if I were to take you outside, could you point to the sky and show me the sun? Okay, considering it's not too cloudy. So you believe that, and you say that, and it's still there, and it's still good. He made it, and it's still good. Do you believe that he made birds and animals? And, and we can point to them, and they're still there. You believe that? What if we couldn't see animals? What if they had all gone extinct a thousand years ago? Would you believe that God made them? <laughs> Do you believe that God made people, man and woman? He made me, made you, made us, made people. You believe that? Okay. The birds and the trees and, and the fish and the main land and the mountains and the rocks and the bushes and the sun and the moon and the stars, all of that stuff is still here. Do you agree with me? Okay, y'all are a bunch of believers now. Genesis chapter 2 says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had made. All right. Verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, set it apart, made it holy. That's what that means. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because that in it he had rested from all of his work which God had made. Now, do you believe that? Do you believe that he made the seventh day? And do you believe that he blessed that day and made it holy? You really believe that? Then why do you change everything? <laughs> the first thing that God made, I say, did God make birds? And you say, come here, Quentin. You see that bird over there on that tree chirping? And I say, yeah. You say, God made that. And I say, do you believe that God made man? And you say, come here, Quentin. Do you see Anthony right there? And I said, yeah. He said, that's what God made right there. That's what he made. Maybe not, might, might hard, not hardly be what Adam was, but... We've all fallen, man. We've all fallen. <laughs> And I say, do you believe that God made bushes and trees? And you say, get over here, Quentin. You feel that grass underneath our feet? God made that, man. You see that tree? God made that big, beautiful tree. Just look at that tree. Didn't you know, make that? God made that. Right? Now, the first thing that God made that takes faith, I said, you should show me the Sabbath. Show me the Holy Sabbath. The first thing that takes faith, the world drops it. We forget it. Think about that. Now, I want you to turn with me <clears throat> in your Bibles this morning to the book of Exodus. And in Exodus, I want to go to chapter 
31 in the book of Exodus. <clears throat> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Exodus chapter 31. And we're going to look at that here in a minute. Now, my sermon today is about not changing things. And really, it's about the day. And I could stop right now. Because God made the world in six days. And on the seventh day, He made the Sabbath. And He blessed that day, and He made it holy. And we'll bring this out even more clearly here in just a second. But have you ever thought about this? God looked at everything that He had made. And He said, what? We read that. When he looked at everything that he had made, after he had made man, he said, he looked at everything he made and it was very good. Very good. Have you ever made anything that you're proud of? And you made it and after you're done making it, you're like, man, that is good. Right? That is, that is good. And I had a friend one time when I was a kid and I had built this bicycle and put it all together. And I had polished it up and waxed it and, and I had it sitting there. And I was in the garage looking at it. And I said, man, that's bad. That's bad. Mm. Oh. And unbeknownst to me, my buddy was hiding, looking in the door. And I was walking around and I said, bad, that's bad. And he never let me live that down. <laughs> he never let me live that down. You know, he come in behind me. Oh, man, that looks good. Oh, oh. He, he ragged me about that for 20 years. If we're 50 years old. I still see him. When you make something, though, and you like it, man, it's great. Then you, you sort of want to have a, a celebration. A celebration. And when God made the world, I mean, we're not talking about a truck. We're not talking about a car. We're not talking about an oil painting. We're not talking about a song that you wrote or a poem that you did. We're talking about, I sound like that guy on that commercial. We're talking about making the world. We're, talking about making, we're not talking about practice. We're talking, we're talking about making the world. And God said, you know, I'm going to take a day right here. And this day, this number seventh day, is going to be a memorial that I created the entire world. I'm going to set this day aside, special, sanctified, set it apart, special and holy. I'm going to set this day apart, and nothing can be holy. Get this, nothing can be holy. Only God is holy. Are you with me? So a day can't be holy unless it's God's, right? And so he said, I'm going to make this day holy right here as a memorial that I created the heavens and the earth. So when we come together on the seventh day of the week, we're here to have a party and celebrate that God is the creator of the heaven and earth. That's what that's about. Now catch this. Catch this. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a memorial of the, of the Creator, okay? Unless the Creator changes, and we got a different Creator, that day can't change. Are you with me? It's a memorial that God is the Creator of heaven and earth. And unless the Creator changes, and we get a different Creator, I don't know how you'd even do that, if we get a different Creator, the day can't change. Now, here in Exodus chapter 31, I already told you to turn to an hour ago. In 31, I want to look here at verse 18. 31 verse 18. And this is after Israel became a nation in Egypt for hundreds of years. And in Egypt, they had all of this idolatry around them. And they had completely lost their ways. They had been made slaves. And you know, the interesting thing about a slave is they didn't have days off. They didn't have days off. They didn't have Saturday off and Sunday off. They didn't have days off. They didn't get vacations. I was talking to somebody yesterday. He said, I'm taking a week-long vacation next week. I'm taking off. I said, you get paid for that? He says, nope. I said, you don't get no vacation? He says, nope. Job don't give no vacation. I said, you just taking off? He said, yep. I said, they let you take off? He said, I told him I was. <laughs> He's going to take a week vacation. No pay, no nothing. I said, man, that stinks. He said, I know. <clears throat> week off, no pay. But these guys, they never got a day off. As a matter of fact, Moses come to get them, and they made it even harder on them. Work even more. They didn't have a day off. 
Didn't have a day to worship. Didn't have. And through these hundreds of years, they had forgotten who they were. And sometimes I wonder, you know, we're Christians. And sometimes I wonder if a Christian today could be taken, the best of Christians today could be taken and compared to a Christian shortly after Jesus and how close the comparison would be. I don't know. But here it says in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, it says, And he gave unto Moses, because they came out, and so he says, You know what? I'm going to lay this stuff out for them in stone. Well, they'll know. We'll give them some directions here. And I'm not going, I could write a whole book. I could write a book that thick. As a matter of fact, later on, the Jews did write a book that thick. God says, I could write a book that thick on what to do and what not to do. And all the commandments go, but he says, I'm going to make it really simple. I'm going to give them a quick, short list of ten. And if your heart's right, you're going to hit every one of them. Pow, 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 pow. And so it says here that he took tablets of stone. He gave them to Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon the Mount Sinai. He gave him two tables of testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. I'd like to have that. Does any of you got an autograph of anybody famous? Anybody in here? If you've got an autograph of somebody famous, raise your hand. Not one. Bobby's got something. Okay. Tracy's got something. Any, Greg, no famous autographs? Just my own. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's cool, man. I got, the, I got this, this one thing that from a long time ago, I, an event I went to, and I got a bunch of people sign it, a bunch of professional people sign it. I still got it stuck away somewhere. But it's cool if you can get like an autograph. People love autographs. People pay big money for autographs. Imagine coming down the mountain with stones written by the finger of God etched into the stone. God's signature, his own handwriting. Man, that'd be amazing. The handwriting of God. And so there he was written in stone. Now what does that mean if something's written in stone? We even use that today, don't we? If it's written in stone. I like Cynthia said it the best. If it's written in stone, you can't change it. You can't change it. If you want something to stay the same, write it in stone. That's the reason we've got these graves over here, these tombstones. Some of those things are like hundreds of years old. And you can still see the dates in them because they've been written in stone. Now I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 32. The next chapter, Exodus chapter 32, we're going to look at verse 15 there. And it says in Exodus 32, verse 15, it says, And when Moses turned and went down from the mount with the two tables of testimony in his hands, the tables were written on both their sides, and on one side and on, they were written, and on the other side they were written. And 16 says, And the, table, the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon those tablets with his own finger. Now I want you to turn back with me to Exodus chapter 20. Now what's there in Exodus chapter 20? Every good Christian knows that. You, suppose, you know, every good Christian has got to know John 3.16. And then the second thing that you got to know is Exodus chapter 20 is where God's commandments are. That's the next thing that you know, okay? Exodus chapter 20. And Exodus chapter 20 tells us what these commandments are. And it gives us these things here, and you know, it starts there in verse 3. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, it says, Don't have no other gods before me. And verse 4 says, Don't make any graven images and bow down to them. And then verse 7 is the third one. Don't use the Lord. Don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord God will not hold him guiltless that take his name in vain. And then we get to verse 8. And strange thing there, it says, Remember. Remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Now this is, I don't mind that part. That does not bother me. That don't bother me. Here's the part I don't like. Right here. It says, six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. I want a Sabbath every day. I won't do no work. But that's part of the commandment too. You're supposed to work. 
Be productive. Be a worker. Six days do your work. He says, verse 10, but the Sabbath day, the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God. And in it you shall do no work. Nobody in your house should do no work or anything. Verse 11. Several years ago, if somebody's working for me, I always try to tell them that up front. Hey, man, whatever you do, don't be over here. And most Adventists have got at least one funny story to tell. But I say, whatever you do, don't be over here on Saturday. Take that day off. Don't work over. If you wanted to work Sunday, that's fine. But if you don't want to, take that day off too. I don't care what you do, but whatever you do, don't be over here on Saturday working on my stuff. And I had a guy that was mowing my yard and sucking up my leaves one time, and I told him specifically, I says, do not do it on Saturday, whatever you do. And so we left church, and we were going home. And I came in front of our house, and there he was, wearing it out, leaves and grass flying everywhere. I didn't even know what to do. I freaked plumb out. I never even, I didn't even, I went into a panic mode. I just drove on by like I didn't even live there. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even know, I didn't even know what to do. I just, I just, I, I was just panicked. We was driving around the block. I was telling the man, I said, what do we do? I don't, what do we do? You know, I just, I don't know. And I forget whatever it was. I think we went somewhere or visited or something, came back and it's done and, and, you know, he, I was like, praise the Lord, you know, hope you don't want his money. <laughs> He had to come back tomorrow. I get that for sure. But uh, it, you should do that. You know, I, it's, 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 it's like he says, no, don't nobody work. Don't nobody. Don't have no strangers in your house working or nothing like that. Just don't, don't do it. And that's, that's part of it. But why? Why? In verse 11, it's the only commandment. It's, this commandment is unique and different than all the other commandments. This is the only commandment that gives us a reason. Verse 11. It says, Why? Because in six days the Lord God made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it a holy day, or hallowed it. Remember. That's the only commandment that begins remember. Think about that. Remember. Why did God put remember there? Think about that. I mean, if you believe in God and you believe he made the world, and you believe that he put stuff in the Bible that means something, and he put everything that we need in there and stuff, why would he take that one commandment and put remember in front of it? Think about that. Because that's the only one that he knew that the world would forget. And so he's helping you out. He's giving you a heads up. Whatever you do, remember this one. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't do all. But whatever you do, don't forget this one. We're going to get to that in a minute. Remember it. But the word after it is even more important. The word after it is even, even more important. In verse 8, there it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Keep it holy. Keep it holy. Now, if I say, Cynthia, keep your hand up. Well, that's crazy. Because her hand's not up. You can't keep something that ain't there. Keep going fast. If you're cruising down a road or cruising along, you're doing five mile an hour, and I say, keep going fast. You say, what are you, you're crazy. You have to be doing something or something has to exist or have to, has to be in practice in order to keep it going on. And he says, remember to keep it going. The Sabbath was already in existence. It was already being kept. It was already supposed to be kept. It was already in practice. Keep it going. Remember to keep it going. Now, it was already existed. When you're looking at the commandments, as I said a minute ago, you ask the question. He says, keep the Sabbath, don't do no work in it. And the question may be, why? And God says, because I'm the creator of heaven and earth, and it's a memorial of me, and that I made the world. You know, that's a problem. 
If the world would come, if we would have never got away from the Sabbath day and we come back and recognize God as the creator of heaven and earth every day, we might not have the problem of evolution and atheism and such matters in the world. But who then? Why do we keep it? And you're giving us all this stuff to do. Who? Have you ever heard the old saying, seal the deal? What does it mean when you seal the deal? It means it's done, it's signed, it's sealed, it's delivered, it's wrapped up. There's nothing you can do about it. It's sealed, signed by both parties. Sealed the deal. You close in on a house, you go to the bank, right? You say, what does the house cost? The house costs, I don't know, $200,000. You give them the $200,000. Bobby can attest all this. You give them $200,000. And then you say, now what? And they say, well, we need $3,000 more for this. And you say, oh, me, okay. And you say, okay, it's been two months. Now what? And they say, well, we need $5,000 more for this, right? And you say, oh, me, okay. We're going to close soon. We're going to close any day now. We're going to close any day now. They call you back three weeks later. They say, hey, we're ready to close. We, they say, well, we need $8,000. Right? And it, it just keeps on. After a while, finally, you get to sign the papers and you seal the deal and you're happy. Who's given us these commandments? Who asked this? By what authority? Who are you? And so God, it was so important that he put it right there in the middle of the commandments and he sealed the deal. In the, the fourth commandment says that he is Lord God and he is the creator, the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. It's his seal. You know, like if you had uh, Joe Biden, president, title of territory, United States of America. And so that would be his... Uh, <laughs> it would be his seal. Your name, your title, and your territory. And God has a seal. It's his name, God. And his title, creator. And his ter territory, heaven and earth. It's all there. It's God's seal. And he sealed the Sabbath and the commandments right there. He signed them. Me. I'm the one who did it. I don't know what y'all are laughing at. <laughs> now I want you to look with me. In Leviticus chapter 23, Genesis, Exodus, and then the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 23. And in Leviticus chapter 23, I want to look at verse 3. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3. And here's what he says. Now get this. He says, six days shall work be done. Now does that sound familiar? That's the only part of the commandment I didn't like a minute ago. He says, in six days work shall be done. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. And you should do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, a holy convocation. You know what convocation is? Convocation? It's a, it's a gathering. I actually wrote down the, um, the uh, definition to it somewhere. Oh, it's a large formal assembly of people. That was the definition of it. Convocation, a large formal assembly of people. A large formal assembly of people are a meeting, it says. That's a convocation. So he says, I want you to come together on the Sabbath and you're going to have a convocation. That's an assembly of people on the Sabbath day, the holy day, once a week, worshiping God. Alright, so they got this convocation, this meeting. They're meeting on the Sabbath. Now, I've been told this, that no one can keep the Sabbath. You can't keep the Sabbath. Have you ever been told that? Anybody ever told you you can't keep the Sabbath? You can't keep the Sabbath. And I thought about that. I thought, well, you know, can we keep the Sabbath? Is it keepable? Can it be kept? And they say, oh, you can't keep the Sabbath. You know, it's against the, it's against the rules to light a fire on the Sabbath. It's against the rules to do this on the Sabbath. You can't, you can't even drive to church on the Sabbath. You know? And so I'm thinking, God fixed all that. God fixed all the problems in life. He fixed everything because we have an example. He gave us an example on how to do everything. 
He gave us an example on how to worship, an example on how to act, how to behave. How to, he gave us an example on everything, and God gave us our example. And of course, our example is Jesus Christ. That's our example. So if you want to know how to keep the Sabbath, then you look at how Jesus did it. What did Jesus do? And I want you to turn with me in our Bibles this morning to the New Testament in the, in the book of Luke. And I want to go to Luke chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 4. And I want you to come with me. Luke chapter 4. And we're going to look this morning at verse 14. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And this is what the Bible says. This was right after Jesus had been baptized 40 days in the wilderness and went through the temptation with Satan. And here in verse 14 of Luke chapter 4, it says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region around and about. And so Jesus, he's a pretty popular guy. All eyes on Jesus. He's doing good. And it says here, Luke chapter 4, verse 15, And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And so he's teaching in synagogues. And he's getting, a, he's pretty popular. And it says here, verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue, on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. Now there's some words I've been throwing out here this morning. One of them is convocation, or assembly, or meeting. The word synagogue, do you know what the word synagogue means? The place of the meeting. That's what it means, or the place of assembly. That's what the word synagogue means, the place of assembly. Now, this church building is not our church. Our church is all of us. We're the church. Now we can have church here at this place of meeting, or we can meet another place. We can meet at the lake. We can meet in a garage. We can meet under a shade tree. We can meet anywhere we wanted to meet, because we're the church. And wherever we meet at, that would be the place of meeting. That would be the place of assembly. That would be the place of the convocation where we come together at. And so Jesus, as his custom was, the Bible says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So what did Jesus do on the Sabbath? He went to church. He went to the place of meeting. He went where everybody was at discussing Jesus. He wanted to be there with other people. Now, before I go further, I'll ask you a question. Do you think Jesus was uplifting in church? Do you think Jesus was encouraging in church? If we had a church down the street and Jesus was in that church, would you be at this church? <laughs> I mean, if it was really Jesus. <laughs> because you'd want to be in church with Jesus, wouldn't you? I mean, that would be like the coolest thing. That would be the coolest. I remember several years ago, we went to Nashville, and um, Doug Bachelor was in Nashville. We went to uh, Nashville to see him, and uh, many of you went and seen Doug, and a couple weeks ago, some of you got front row seats. But we did it the wrong way. We just went up. And I, I'm just a country boy. I didn't know. This great big church, you know, twice about the size of the city. And we went there, and, and we went in this little room, and we sat down with about a hundred other people, and we were sitting there, and there was a TV screen. And he came on the TV screen. And we were sitting there watching him on the TV screen. And I said, we could have done this at home. <laughs> and he was down in the main church preaching. But we were hungered up in a room watching him on the television. I thought, man, this stinks. <laughs> but could you imagine Jesus? Everybody would want to be at the church that Jesus was at. And so Jesus was there, and, and that's what he did on the Sabbath. He went to the synagogue. Now, I want you to turn with me to the book of Mark. It's before the book of Luke. In the book of Mark, I want to go to chapter 3. 
Mark chapter 3, and here's some stuff that Jesus started doing on Mark chapter 3, and I want you to look with me here. We're going to begin with verse 1. Mark chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, speaking of Jesus, it says, And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there with a withered hand. And they, church people, they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. This guy's got this withered hand, and he's talking to Jesus, and they can tell Jesus fixing and put the, put the, and they're set. And some guy's like, oh, oh, stop him. It's the Sabbath. And the other guy's like, oh, sh no. See what he does. He's supposed to be a man of God. See what he does. And they're watching. Now Jesus, you know, he's got this, Mind, mind, heart reading thing going on. And so it says, and verse 3, And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, he says, Stand forth. And verse 4 says, And he said unto them, He said unto them, Right? He said unto them, He says, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked around, about on them with anger. When he looked around on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out, and as his hand was restored whole as the other. And from that point, they, they went and looked for some way that they might destroy him. So now, Get this. What did Jesus do? He did good on the Sabbath. He healed somebody. He went to church. He healed somebody. You, you, as you read the Bible in the New Testament and you watch our example of Jesus of how he handled the Sabbath day, you get an insight of what the Sabbath is all about. See, it's not about legalities. It's not about black and white and you can do this and you can't do that. And, 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 and it's not about all that stuff. But it's about honoring God as the creator of heaven and earth and making it a special holy day dedicated to God. Perhaps you leave here and you go to the hospital and you visit people. Perhaps you leave here and you go to the, the, the nursing home. Perhaps you leave here and you go to someone's house and you do a house dedication. Perhaps you leave church and you go do a Bible study. All of these things, you know, perhaps you go home and you go outside and you read your Bible and you study with the Lord. Whatever it may be, all of these things... It's about, this, the whole law is about the spirit. Let me give you an example. You wake up one day, you got a headache, a splitting headache. And, and your stomach don't feel too great either. But you're okay, you know. You get dressed, and you go to Walmart. And you're cruising through Walmart, and you see somebody you know. And they say, hey man, how you doing? And what do you say? I'm doing fine, you liar. Right? That's preposterous, isn't it? That's preposterous. And it's not about the legalities of it. It's about the heart of the matter, what it really is. And those things are they're, they're guidelines about what is. And you're supposed to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It's not about what you did or what you didn't do or if you cut the light switch on or if you didn't or if you washed your hands and all that crazy stuff. It's a special day set aside to do the works of God and display God to the world. God is creator of heaven and earth, and he loves you. And that's what the day is about. Luke chapter 13. Turn with me, please. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in Luke chapter 13. And in Luke chapter 13, I want to look at verse 10. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. And it says here, <clears throat> again, when Jesus was teaching, Luke chapter 13, verse 10, and when he was teaching, it says, uh, in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, verse 11, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. And she was bowed together, and could in no wise lift up herself. And Jesus saw her, he called, unto, he called her unto him, and he said unto her, Woman, you are loose from this infirmity. And when he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now, this is the kicker. Verse 14. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation 
because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And he said to the people, this blows me away. He says to the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. Now keep in mind, he's quoting the commandment. I've just quoted that to you twice. He's an elder and her down there. He's got the law. He's got it right. He says, there are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed, but not on the Sabbath day. <laughs> wow, man. He's, he's got the commandment down pat. He knows it. He knows the letter of the law. But he's missing the whole thing. The whole thing's just whoosh, blowing right by him. In verse 15, it says, The Lord answered him and said, You hypocrite! Do not each one of you on the Sabbath day take his ox or his donkey loose from the stall and lead him away to water? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan hath bound the 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all of his adversaries were ashamed. They should have been. And all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Now, can you imagine church that day? Before Jesus came to church, before Jesus was in church, this was church. And after Jesus starts coming to church, it's like this. Amen. Glory. Yeah, I, I, it's a whole different atmosphere. You know why? Because Jesus knew how to keep the Sabbath. That is our example. It's not about all this legal stuff and can't do this and do this and do that and do this and all these things. We've got some crazy stuff that, that we do. Sometimes we call them our Sabbath rituals. And I hope all of you do too. I remember we've sort of got out of this ritual but we used to make, every Sabbath evening, we would make about that big one of those chocolate chip cookies. And on that chocolate chip cookie, we would put some ice cream. And that was our Sabbath evening dessert. And we had that every, we have a special, we have, a, and this, we've got this going on forever. We have a special Sabbath meal that we eat every Friday evening of our entire life. They even know what it is. They even know, the family even knows what it is. And we got a special meal. Now let me tell you something. It's, 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 it's black beans and it's rice and it's some, some more stuff. Now, let me tell you something. If you guys don't eat that meal, you're breaking the Sabbath. Now you say, Quentin, that's crazy. That's insane. And you'd be right. That's our little thing that we do. It makes the Sabbath special. We got a bunch of special little things that we do. And you should too. It's not about black and white and this and that. It's about separating yourself from the normal world and the normal day and what you would normally be doing and it's set aside for God. And you make it a special day between you and the Lord. And that's what it's all about. It's a wonderful thing. Now, Jesus kept the Sabbath, and, and all of these times, you go through the New Testament, and he's, he has the, probably the most arguments that Jesus has is over the Sabbath day. And it would have been so easy for Jesus to say, well, you don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. I mean, that would have trumped all, that would have trumped all arguments. And don't think you'd be scared to say it. He had no trouble saying, I'm the Son of God. I am. You think he'd be scared to say, you don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. I'm going to abolish that one. But in fact, our scripture reading today said just the opposite. He says, thank not that I've come to change that. I'm not going to do it all. He had plenty of opportunities. But never once did Jesus say, you don't have to keep it. You don't have to worry about it. That's fixing to be done away with. None of, he never said that. Every time that there was ever an argument, Jesus stood boldly and taught him the correct way to keep the Sabbath. Jesus, now keep in mind, when God gave him the Ten Commandments, in the middle of it, it was sealed with a seal. And Jesus, he did his ministry. He did his work. And then they put him on that cross. And before he passed, he says, it is it's finished. 
He said, it is finished. Somebody said, done, that's good enough. He said, it is finished. Now, what did God do? He finished. His work was finished. And then he blessed the Sabbath day, and he rested on the Sabbath day. Jesus finished his work, and like father, like son, he rested on the Sabbath day in the tomb. The Sabbath is the seal of Jesus' work, of, of his creating the, 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 the new covenant, just as much as God's work creating the world in the beginning. Like father, like son, the same day. Even when you look in Matthew, the last chapter of Matthew, and it's talking about the tomb of Jesus there. Actually, I believe it's Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse 66. I think I'm telling you right. And I was thinking about that this, this morning as we were in Sabbath school. I was looking at this, and this came to my mind. And it's Matthew uh, 27, uh, beginning of verse 59. And it says, and, 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 and Joseph had taken the body, that's Jesus' body, and wrapped it in linen cloth. And they laid it in a tomb, in a tomb, tomb out of, hewn out of rock. And they rolled a great stone over the door of the grave of, of the thing, and they left. And then 61, it says that Mary Magdalene came against, and, and you can read down uh, through there, but in verse 66, it says, So they went and made the scepter secure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. They sealed the stone. Even Jesus had a seal on the Sabbath day. Because when he went to that tomb, and he was put away, and they rolled the stone over, it was signed, sealed, and delivered. The deal was sealed. It was over. Jesus had won. Okay? And so that was Jesus. And, and, and Jesus kept the Sabbath. And that's how he kept the Sabbath. And he went to this church every Sabbath. That's what Jesus did, man. People say, I don't like church. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to be part of a church. And we're going to touch on that in a minute. But I don't want to be part of the church. And, but yet, I'm a Christian. But Jesus went to church on Saturday. That's what he did. That's what the man did. And I want to be just like him. I want to be like Jesus. He's my hero. After Jesus died, how did they keep the Sabbath? Now I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then we've got the book of Acts. And I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts. And I'm going to try to hurry this up for you. Book of Acts, chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Now, Acts is the Acts of the Apostles, and it's the beginning of the church, and it's how the church was established, and how it was set up, and what they were, what they were doing. And I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 11. And in Acts chapter 11, um, I want to look at uh, verse 25. Acts chapter 11, verse 25. Now, this is the New Testament church. Okay? This is, this is how they established the New Testament church. This is what it's all about, the book of Acts. It's, it's got you, you, your elders and your deacons and all this good stuff in it. it, it hey, man, it, if you're going to set up a church, this is where you do it at. Okay? And here's what the Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 11, beginning of verse 25. It says, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus, for to seek Saul. So he's looking for Saul. Verse 26. It says, When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Where did he bring him? Antioch. Okay? He brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass, a whole year, they assembled themselves together with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now what were they called? Christians. That's right. So the first time they were called Christians, it was in Antioch, and these were these people, and they were Christians, and that's the, that's the beginning of Christianity, okay? And they were called Christians because they were Christians. That's where it, Christians. They're like Christ. They believe in Christ. They follow Christ. They pursue Christ. They worship Christ. Christ, Christ, Christ. Christians. That's how they got that name. Now they're here in Antioch. Antioch is the place that they were called Christians first. So that's where the church was started there. That's where things came together. That's what they started doing. And so what we need to do is hone in on it and say, what did these people do? And how did they worship? So now, they're there in Antioch. And you, you, in verse 12, I'm sorry, chapter 12 of Acts, it tells us this, this uh, 
this whole story here about how Peter was locked up in jail and they prayed and he got out. But let's look at Acts chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Now there were in the church that was in Antioch. Okay? So I just wanted to let you know the introductory in chapter 13, where are we at? Okay? And what were the people called that went to church in Antioch? They were called? Okay. So we had Christians in, in Antioch, the first Christian church, the first time they called Christians, and they're there in Antioch. And I want you to look with me uh, as we move along here in the same chapter, chapter 13, in verse 14. It says, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Persida, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. So, when were they having church in Antioch? When were the Christians having church in Antioch? They were having it on the, on the Sabbath day. That's what the Bible says. I'm, I, that's what the Bible says, okay? Now, also, as we're just grazing through this chapter, something interesting, I want you to look at verse 27. It says, For they that dwell at Jerusalem, and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And the only reason I wanted to bring your attention to that verse is because the, the prophets, when it says the prophets, they didn't have Old Testament, New Testament, King James Holy Bible, but they had the law and the prophets. The law was the first five of the books of the Bible, and then the prophets was the rest of the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament yet. So when they talk about reading the law and the prophets, they're talking about reading the Bible. Okay? And so what it says here in verse 27 is it says they, read, they have their prophets read to them every Sabbath day. So the Christians in Antioch are meeting every Sabbath and they're studying and reading their Bibles. That, that's what I'm just reading this to you. Do you understand? That's what the New Testament church was doing. Nothing's been changed. And so I want you to keep reading with me there in Acts chapter 13 and verse 42. In verse 42... It says, in the Jews, they were there too. They had Jews and they had regular people. It says, the Jews, when they were going out of the synagogue, the Gentiles. Now, who is a Gentile? That's anybody who's not a Jew. That's your Greeks, that's your Romans, that's your whoever. That's your Gentiles. And the Bible says there in verse 42, when the Jews were going out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Because even the Gentiles have done figured that out. These guys meet every Saturday. Are you with me? They're in there every Saturday. And so they come, they hear a little bit of what's going on. Maybe they missed the perverse part of it. I don't know. But they hear a little bit of what's going on. Church is breaking up. People are going out. And they come to Paul and they say, Hey, man, can you preach that same? That was good. I got a sermon that I preached a long time ago. And I don't really remember all of it exactly. Because I try never to preach the same thing twice exactly. And... But it's one that Cynthia likes. And she's begged me like 300 times. She says, please preach that one again. Preach that one again. Right? And that's the way they were. I, I, I can't remember it. <laughs> that's the secret. And she says, preach that one again. Preach that one again. And that's the way these guys, they say, will you come next Saturday? We'll come to church and will you preach it again? We want to hear the rest of that. But they knew that they had to wait till the next Saturday to hear it. Now, I'm not saying you can't worship any day. Please do worship any day. Every day is good to worship God. But they knew that these people were coming together and having church every Saturday. If they wanted to hear it, man, they could come next Saturday and they could hear it. And so here we got, and it says in verse 43, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Verse 44. Now the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the Word of God. So the next Sabbath day, all the Jews, all the Gentiles, all the scallywags, everybody in the county, they all came together to worship God. I would love to have a day in church like that. I had a dream a long time ago that we were in this church right here. It scares me to death because we got the windows cocked up. But we had a meeting in this church right here, and, and we had this meeting in this church, and I was preaching, and all the pews got so filled up, and people had to stand up, and then they opened the windows. And as I was preaching, I caught a glimpse outside the window, and there was like people just filled up out in the streets. It's like a crazy dream. And, when, and I woke up, you know. I was like, wow. 
That was an amazing dream. All those people and everywhere looking out the street, how amazing. And that's the way it was that day. The whole town came together on the Sabbath day to hear the Christians preaching in Antioch. And that's what the Bible tells us was going on. There was no change. From the old to the new, it was the same. And I want to touch on one more, Acts chapter, 15, Acts chapter 16. And I like this one. Because in this one right here, they didn't even have a synagogue. They didn't even have a synagogue. Some people say, well, that was a synagogue. and they didn't actually remember. But they didn't even have a synagogue here in Philippi. And I want to go to Acts chapter 16 and uh, verse 12. <clears throat> and it says, And from thence they went to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days, several days. In verse 13, And on the Sabbath day... We went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was accustomed to being made or want to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which gathered there or resorted there, which gathered there. And so they didn't even have a synagogue, but they still came together every Sabbath by this certain spot at the river. That's where they hooked up and they had a convocation. They had a meeting. Every Sabbath, and they came together, and Paul and Barnabas, they came to the city, they found out where, they said, where's the sin? We don't have a synagogue? Well, what, will they meet down here? And they went down there, and they had church by the riverside on the Sabbath. That's what the New Testament church was doing. The Christians. That's not me. I'm just reading you what's in here. There's no change. And so what about all the way throughout the Bible. And we come all the way to the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, I've got just a few more verses. I'm going to cut you loose, I promise. In the book of Revelation, and you go right to the first part of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, the first chapter of Revelation, in verse 10 there, and we got John. Now John walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, worshiped with Jesus on the Sabbath day, and here in verse 10 of Revelation chapter 1, and the reason I want to bring this out is because this is the last book of the Bible. This Bible, not all books are in order, but the book of Revelation is in order. It was the last book written. It was written in 96 AD. It was like 60-something years after Jesus had died on the cross. And he says here in verse 10, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet. Aha! There you go, Quinn. The Lord's day. He didn't say Sabbath. He said the Lord's day. And so we got to go through the Bible and find what the Lord's day is. Now it tells us in the Old Testament, in, in, in Isaiah, uh, I believe 58, what the Lord's day is. But let's don't even do that. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to the book of Mark. And Jesus, actually there, it's in several books. But let's go to the book of Mark. And I won't go to the book of Mark in chapter 2. Book of Mark chapter 2. And again, um, the problem here, I want to look at Mark chapter 2 verse 23. Because there's two, two points in this. Mark chapter 2 verse 23. It says, And it came to pass that he, speaking of Jesus, went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. Mark chapter 2 verse 23. Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. He's already living on the edge there. And his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. Not only are they walking too far on the Sabbath, now they're stealing. In verse 24, it says, And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And Jesus went through a little spill there, talking about King David and how he had to eat the bread in the temple and stuff like that. Jesus... <laughs> I was going to say, Jesus did drive through on the Sabbath. But I don't, want to, I don't want to lead you straight. But Jesus ate on the Sabbath. They, made them, they got them something to eat, and they ate on the Sabbath, okay? There again, we see Jesus, I mean, taking care of business on the Sabbath. They're on their way, they're working, they're doing the Lord's work, and they get them something to eat, okay? And so, anyway, but here's my point. Back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, here in Mark, what is the Lord's day? In verse 28, it says, Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord... Also of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath day. Okay? Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath day. And so if it's the Lord's day, 
That's the Sabbath day. The Lord's day is the Sabbath day. And so even in AD 96, the last book of the Bible, John on the island of Patmos, they were still regarding the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, as a holy day. Now I want to go to two more scriptures, and I'm going to cut you loose, I promise. And I want to go to the book of Matthew chapter 24. The book of Matthew chapter 24. And in this book of Matthew chapter 24, this is one of the, the, the good, the, this is the revelation of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24, and it begins in Matthew 24 when Jesus, they're at the temple, and Jesus' disciples say, man, Jesus, check this temple out. Isn't it amazing? Because remember, the disciples are still in the mindset in Matthew 24, they're still in the mindset that Jesus is going to set up a kingdom on this earth and take over. All right? An earthly kingdom. And they're looking at this temple, and they're like, man, Jesus, look at this temple. Man, look at these columns. Look at this gold work. Isn't this something? And Jesus says, marvel not at this, dude, because I'm telling you that the days are coming, and they're not far away, that all of this is going to be crumbled to the ground. Now, you can go to Jerusalem today, Middle East, and the only thing that's left is one of the outside walls. Okay? What Jesus said came to pass. Fairly soon, in A.D. 70, it, they, sure enough, they tore down the whole temple. All right? And, and so, after that, they come to him private, and they said, Hey, man, can you tell us, and I'd probably be asking Jesus the same question, can you tell us when the end is going to be? Okay? When is the end going to be? And so in Matthew 24, he goes into this whole spiel about telling us about the end of the world and how things are going to be wrapped up and, and what to watch for and what to look for. Now, I want you to look with me in Matthew 24, verse 20. He's telling them about the end now, our time, our day. Jesus coming soon. And he says here in Matthew chapter 24, verse 20, he says, But pray you that your flight will not be the time that you've got to run, the time that you've got to get it, the time that you've got to make an escape, the time that you have to flee from your home. He says, May, pray, in verse 20, pray that your flight will not be in the... Now, I don't understand that because the Sabbath is done away with, right? Obviously, if the Sabbath had been done away with, if the Sabbath didn't matter, then Jesus wouldn't be telling me that in the last days, before He comes, and times get rough, pray that your flight is not going to have to be on the Sabbath day. And I've thought a lot about that. I don't know exactly what it means, <clears throat> to be honest with you. But He told us to pray it. But I do look at some things. If today was our day, it'd be pretty easy for Him to come in here and get every one of us. <laughs> Pray that it's not on the Sabbath day because you're going to be convocating. You're going to be meeting. You're going to be together. So pray that that day is not on the Sabbath day because it would be easy for them to get every one of you. Perhaps that's what he's saying. One more scripture and I'm out of here. This is my favorite one because I want to look at it in a context that you've never looked at it before. And I want you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews chapter 10. The book of Hebrews chapter 10. And here in chapter 10, now <clears throat> I want you to look at this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And here's what it says. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And let's start with verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. It says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Okay? Verse 25. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as ye see the day approaching. Now catch that. He says, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together. Now do you remember way back when we looked in Leviticus chapter 23 and I read that fancy word to you and it said that on the Sabbath you come together and it will be a holy convocation to you. You remember that? And I read you the definition which meant an assembly, a large assembly of a group of people coming together. Okay? So this is a convo convocation right here that he's talking about. This assembling of yourselves together, this convocation. So... Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25, he says, not forsaking, you could say, the convocation. Don't forsake the convocation, okay, um, as the manner of some is. So he's saying, even during this time, some people had already stopped meeting at synagogues and at churches on the Sabbath. 
They had already, perhaps it was to segregate themselves from the, the Jews or, or the Romans or, or who knows what, but some had already stopped it. Somebody had, some people had already stopped the meeting. He says, but you don't stop assembling yourselves together. You guys don't stop the meeting. But some had stopped the convocation. But he says, you guys don't stop the convocation. But some people had stopped the convocation. Are you with me? I meant to repeat this 20 times to make it really plain. He says, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. What is the day? It's the coming of Jesus. So he says, get this, guys. He says, the day's coming. He says, don't stop worshiping on the Sabbath as many people have done. This is for our day and time. As many people have done, don't stop that. Don't follow that. Don't follow the world, but keep worshiping on the Sabbath. And even more so, let me put it in street terms, get your butt in church, especially when the end is near. And then all this comes to make sense. Verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for our sins. In the last days before Jesus returns, when you receive the truth of the seal of God, when you receive and learn of the truth, if you refuse to change your ways then, there's no more sacrifice for your sins. You're going to lose it. Are you with me? Some people say probation closes. In verse 27, but a certain fearful looking forward to judgment and a fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Don't forsake the assembly of God. Don't forsake the assembly of yourselves. And even more so, our churches should be loaded to the gills every Sabbath knowing the times that we live in. Jesus says you can look at the fruit of a tree and know when it's ripe. And we can look around the world and see the things going on around us and we know that the end is near. And when we see that, he says, ever more so, whatever you do, do not stop the holy convocation of coming together and worshiping. And if you know the truth and when you learn the truth, if you reject it then, there's no way that you're going to make it. I love you and thank you for your time, guys. Let's sing our closing hymn. And I believe it's number...